Hey, um, welcome everyone today to uh, the online cost of inference seminar. Um, today we have two PhD talks, um, uh, Sean Ying Lee from Stanford University and uh, Michael Oberst from MIT. And you can see the titles of their talks uh, on the screen. Um, in the Q&A, we have uh, uh, Stefan Wagger, uh, who's the co-author of Sean Ying and uh, um, <clears throat> Sorry, Nikolai um, Theodor uh, Thames, um, who is a co-author of uh, Michael, uh, and they will be joining us and answer questions uh, if you may have. Um, today's questions will be handled by Georgia. Um, Georgia, do you want to say a few things about the format? I think everyone's familiar by now, but uh, just in case we have some new attendees, uh, please submit your questions through Q&A. Stefan and Nikolai will be answering your questions live there. And uh, if some questions are uh, picked, uh, we might ask them live as well. Um, please refrain from using the chat to ask questions as this complicates the Q&A. Thank you. And now we're, we're ready for the talks. Well, can can people see the screen? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Fang Ying Li. I'm a, currently a fifth year PhD student at Stanford University. So I want to first of all say thank you to all the organizers of this amazing seminar. I've been following the previous talks and learned a lot. I'm very, very happy to be here to give a talk. So the topic of my talk today is this random graph asymptotics for treatment effect estimation under network interference. And uh, this is a joint work with my advisor, Stefan. Stefan, I think, is also there for Q&A. So feel free to ask him or me any questions. And um, um, so this, this talk is based on the paper with the same title. And we are happy to see it uh, forthcoming at Annals of Stats. You can also find it online on Archive. OK. So before I go into the detail of like treatment effect estimation, I want to start with a very brief introduction on interference. So classically, when people do causal inference, we usually assume that there is no interference. That is, treatment applied to one unit does not affect the outcome for another unit. But this is not the case in many, many real life applications. Here, I just borrow one simple application from this paper, high 2015. And I'll illustrate that in this paper, interference exists. And uh, of course, there are many other examples where we see interference exist. So in this example, we have a group of farmers and we toss coin to decide, oops. We toss coin to decide whether we want to put the farmer into the treatment group or into the control group. And then, we put people, we put the farmers here in the control group and here in the treatment group. And for people in the treatment group, we give them an information session. And during this information session, we tell them all the benefit about the weather insurance. And the goal of this study is to see what is the effect of this information session on farmers' final like, financial decision on whether they'll purchase the weather insurance or not. So naturally you would expect interference in this case exist because let's say this guy, even if this guy didn't go to the information session, he could still learn about the information session from his friend, say this guy. So it could happen that this two person, oops. Um, why is it stuck? Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry. I was saying that those two person could be friends and then this person, even if this person didn't go to the information session, this person went, and this person could tell all the benefit about the insurance to this person. So formally, we say that the treatment of this person impact the financial decision or the outcome of this person. So more generally, we call this, the treatment assigned to one unit affect the observed outcomes for other units. In other words, we say interference exists. So in this project, we seek to estimate causal effects in the presence of such cross-unit interference. Okay, just a bit more notations on uh, how do we model this interference. So we assume that we have N subjects, index I from one to N. We have a treatment WI, which are between, uh, which are like either zero or one. And we assume WI are independent Bernoulli pi. 
And specifically here, one means it's in the treatment group and zero means it's in the control group. And we assume we have a potential outcome model, yi equals yiw equals yiwi w minus i. What this says is the outcome of the ice person depends on the treatment of its own and the treatment of all the other people. So um, classically, if we assume there's no interference, we usually just say yi wi. But here we consider interference, so we have this W minus I, which is treatment of other people. And um, we assume the network interference model here, that is there exists a network order graph with, with the I've said EIJ, such that the I's outcome may only depend on the J's treatment assignment if there is an edge from I to J. So let's take the simple graph as, as an example. So we have like five units here, one, two, three, four, five. So let's let's say we look at this four here. So four is friends of two, three, and five. So what the above assumption says is an outcome of course depends on its own treatment. And it also depends on treatment of two, three, and five, but it does not depend on treatment of one. So this kind of makes sense because if we think about the network as a friendship network, then sort of one and four doesn't have an edge. That means one and four don't know each other. So when they don't know each other, it's hard to imagine that the treatment of one could impact the outcome of four. Okay. Oh, oh it's stuck again. Oh. Okay. So I'll go to uh, specifically what we do in this project because we have the random graph asymptotics in the title. So in the existing literature, people usually take interference graph and potential outcomes as deterministic, and inference is entirely driven by random treatment assignment. We naturally ask the following question, does such strict randomization inference limit the power of estimation? And maybe some sort of stochastic modeling can help guide methodological advances. So in this project, we investigate the problem of treatment effect estimation under random graph asymptotics, Specifically, we assume that the interference graph is a random draw from an unknown graph. It's completely fine if you have no idea what I'm talking about here. Uh, I'll, I'll make all of this precise in a few slides. And we will actually see later that use of such random graph asymptotics lets us obtain considerably stronger guarantees. So before I move into uh, what are the things we wanna estimate, I'll introduce a few more assumptions. The first assumption, as a very simple one, it's just undirected relationship, saying that the interference network of graph has undirected edges. And the second assumption is our key assumption called the random graph assumption. It says each subject has a random type UI, IID from uniform zero one, and there is a measurable function GN that takes two arguments like a UI and a UJ and outputs a number between zero and one. This function is called graph on, because in short for like graph function. And then each edge EIJ is generated independently from a Bernoulli with probability GN UIUJ. So um, you can think of this, there are some examples that fit into this model. So I think one intuitive example is if you think this UI is, for example, the personality of the ice person. And then the higher UI is, the more outgoing this person is. So, uh, what this says is that the probability of the I's person becoming friends with the J's person sort of depends on the random type of I, which is UI, and the random type UJ. And if, if we think about UI as a personality, then you would imagine this G may be like an increasing function in both UI and UJ because sort of outgoing people make more friends. Okay, so um, here are just like two very simple examples of the graph on. And um, specifically this example on the right, this is actually a special case of the graph on, which is the stochastic block model. So how do we think about this? We think, okay, so let's say um, if this UI, this random type UI is between zero and a third, then we think this ice person is in the first community. If it's between a certain two third, then it's in the second community, otherwise it's in the third community. So the stochastic block model says that um, sort of the probability of two people make friends uh, only depends on which community they belong to, whether they belong to the same community, different community, which community they belong to. So this uh, stochastic flow model is just a special case of this graph. Okay. So that's the second assumption. 
And the third assumption is also a key assumption. Um, this assumption is called anonymous interference, which states the following. The potential outcomes do not depend on the identities of their neighbors, and instead only depends on the fraction of pretty neighbors. Specifically, here we have the outcome equals F theta i, W i, some, some other things. I'll explain the terms one by one. So this theta i is some individual characteristic of this ice person. So we assume that the theta i could be depending on the previous random type ui on the previous slide. And this wi is the ice person's own treatment. And this is the proportion of treating neighbors. So what this assumption says is my outcome, the, the ice person's outcome depends on some individual characteristic of this ice person, its own treatment, and it depends on the treatment of its neighbors only through the proportion of treating neighbors. So again, if we look at a simple example here, we have one, two, three, four, five people here, and the fourth person has uh, three neighbors, two, three, and five. So among them, two and three are treated and five is control. So this assumption says, sure, four depends on the treatment of two, three, and five, but only through the proportion of treating neighbor, which is uh, two thirds here, because we have two, two, uh, two treatments out, um, out of the three neighbors. Okay, and that's our third assumption. And, um, and the fourth assumption is about how sparse the graph is. We call this assumption the graph on sequence, which says, okay, our GN, which is the probability of forming an edge, equals rho n times g, where this g is something that's not growing with n, not growing, not changing with n. And we consider two separate scenarios. One is the dense graph scenario where this rho n is constant and one, and the other is a sparse graph, which says rho n goes to zero. This is a technical assumption saying that rho n shouldn't go to zero too fast. And um, so here are just two illustrations uh, of the dense graph and the sparse graph. In the dense graph, we see like a lot of edges here. And in the sparse graph, we see like way fewer edges. So uh, another way of thinking about the dense graph and the sparse graph is the following. So in, if we are in the dense graph regime, then sort of the number of neighbors I have goes to infinity as the same, at the same rate as the total number of people in the world. While the sparse graph says, Okay, my number of neighbors go to infinity, but at a lower rate compared to the total number of people in the world. So that's the two different, that's the two regime. We'll separately consider this two regime um, for the estimation problems later. Okay, now we are ready to move on to what are the things we want to estimate in those settings. So specifically, we are interested in three different estimates. We call them direct effect, the indirect effect, and the total effect. I'll explain them one by one. So what is this direct effect? The direct effect is about if I change my treatment from zero to one, what happens to me and take the average for people. And so this is the effect of my treatment on myself. Indirect effect is what is the effect of my treatment on all the other people in the world, take the sum of those changes, and then take the average over index. Okay, so indirect effect is about my, my treat, the effect of my treatment on other people's outcome. And total effect is something slightly different. Recall that in the previous farmer example, we toss a coin and decide whether the farmer go to the treatment group or go to the control group. So the total effect is about if I change the coin a little bit, increase the probability for, get, for getting treatment a little bit, what happens to the overall outcome? Okay, so we all, We'll talk about estimating direct, indirect effect and total effect later on. And um, in this other paper by uh, Yu Chen Hu, me and Stefan, uh, we show that in any Bernoulli experiments, actually the total effect has a nice decomposition. The total effect actually equals the direct effect plus indirect effect. And in the classical non-interference setting, you would imagine your interference graph has no edge. So that would mean that the indirect effect is zero and so that the direct effect is just the same as the total effect. So later on, we'll separately talk, discuss the estimation of direct effect and the estimation of indirect effect. And in order to estimate the total effect, you, you just like take the sum of your estimator of the direct effect and the indirect effect. Okay. And um, should I pause for any question? 
Let's wait to see if Stefan will flag in for you to answer live. He seems to be doing some work on, on the Q&A. Okay, okay. So go ahead. Thank you. Cool. So now I'll actually move on to talk about estimating the direct effect and then move on to talk about estimating the indirect effect. So we'll start with estimating the direct effect. So to estimate the direct effect, there are two natural estimators the Hallways-Thompson estimator and the Hayek estimator. If you look at a form, the Hallways-Thompson estimator is also the IPW estimator. And the Hayek estimator, you can think of this as the difference in mean, where this is just the treatment, the mean of the treatment group minus the mean of the control group. So in this very nice paper, the authors show that um, actually both estimators, a Hallways-Thompson and the Hayek estimator, are consistent for the direct effect in sparse graphs with the rate of convergence depends on the degree of graph and approaches the parametric one over root n rate as we push towards the setting where the degree is bounded. So I wanna emphasize that in this paper, the sort of the only assumption they make is that is this network interference assumption and they assume the graph is sparse. They didn't make any of the uh, random graph assumption or the anonymous interference assumption. So we on the other hand, uh, making use of such assumptions and make the results much stronger. So we show that both estimators are actually consistent for the direct effect in both sparse and dense graphs and find that it has a one over root n rate of convergence regardless of the degree. So what the conclusion is that if you believe the previous assumptions make sense, then sort of the, the bounds that they have in this paper is slightly more conservative and uh, we get stronger results for those two estimators. And uh, more precisely, what we get is the following. Um, we get a central limit theorem that says square root n, this estimator minus the estimand converge nicely to a normal distribution with, uh, with some variance. So just by looking at the form here, we know that the asymptotic accuracy of our estimator does not depend on the sparsity level rho n and direct effects are accurately estimable even in dense graphs, okay? So this has the sort of this row, uh, this interference wouldn't hurt the convergence rate of the estimator. On the other hand, um, so if we look closely at the form, um, so please trust me on this, this QI is a term that's related to interference. So in the case without interference, it's basically about removing all the contributions of QI. So when there's no interference, this would just converge to expectation RI squared, and this would to blah, blah times the variance RI. So unless RI and QI are strongly negatively correlated, we usually expect that this interference effect inflate the variance. So combining with the previous conclusion, this says interference didn't hurt the rate of convergence, but it inflate the variance of the estimator. One uh, final thing I want to mention here is that um, the, the sort of the, to estimate this direct effect, we didn't we don't need any knowledge of the graph. So the only thing we need is the treatment for everyone and the con uh, and the outcome for everyone. Recall that our estimator just takes this form, and the form didn't involve like anything related to the graph. But we will see later that for to estimate the indirect effect, we do need the graph. So I think that's it for estimating the direct effect. We have a nice estimator and have a nice central limit theorem for it. Now we'll move on to the harder task that is estimating the indirect effect. So it's stuck again. Okay, so about estimating the indirect effect. So in the existing literature, Usually, in order to estimate either the direct, indirect effect or the total effect, people usually assume we have access to many independent networks. So, so in that case, you just give a treatment probability to one network and a different treatment probability to a different network and just like contrasting the two, and you get a kind of a total effect. So, but this is not the case in many applications. In most applications, we only have access to one single network. And, um, but the problem is much harder. So in the regime of single network, this nice paper Liang 2020, they study a case where the number of neighbors is of constant order. And they show a parametric one over root n rate for estimating both the direct and the indirect effect. 
here we work in a much, much denser setting where we didn't see, we didn't know any existing results based on randomization inference. And we'll see later that we propose a consistent estimator and show a central limit theorem for the proposed estimator. Okay. So before I move on to how our estimator work, I want to discuss a little bit of why identification itself is possible. Um, so re recall that previously when we define an indirect effect, we say indirect effect is the effect of my treatment on other people. So we have a proposition that says, okay, we can actually express the indirect effect slightly differently. We can say indirect effect actually also equals to other people's, uh, other people's treatment on me. Specifically, um, if we look at this f function, we call this f as the potential outcome function that takes the two arguments of my treatment and the proportion of treating neighbors. This says roughly the indirect effect equals the derivative of my potential outcome with respect to the proportion of treating neighbors. Okay, so with this proposition, Naturally, we would think if we want to estimate the indirect effect, we would want to contrast the two group of people, the group of people who have higher proportion of neighbors and the group of people who have lower proportion of treating neighbors. So specifically, um, I'm, there, there are people who are just lucky and happen to have a higher proportion of treating neighbors. And those are, there are people who are unlucky who have lower proportion of treating neighbors. So if we contrasting uh, those two group of people, maybe we can get something that's related to this indirect effect. So to make this precise, um, we come up with an unbiased estimator, uh, which has the following form. It equals one over n sum i y i, times mi over pi minus ni minus mi over one minus pi, where mi is the number of treating neighbors and ni is the number of neighbors. So what this weight here is, this weight is gonna be positive if the proportion of treating neighbor is high and otherwise it's gonna be negative. So what this unbiased estimator is doing is it's actually contrasting the uh, people with higher proportion of treating neighbors and people with lower proportion of treating neighbors. Just trust me, this is unbiased. I think it takes a while to verify, but this is a non-biased estimator. Everything seems promising so far. We have an unbiased estimator, but the problem is um, if we compute the variance, we realize the variance of this estimator scales like n rho and square. Recall that previously we have a technical assumption saying that uh, rho and shouldn't go to zero too fast. In other words, we require n rho and square to go to infinity. In other words, this um, the bias, oh, sorry, the variance of this unbiased estimator simply explodes, even if it's unbiased. So we didn't, we don't want to like fully abandon this estimator. Uh, we want to study why this estimator fails and see whether we can fix it and to make a better estimator. So we'll start with studying why this estimator fails. Let's consider the simplest graph bound ever consider the Erdos Rainy model where each edge are formed independently with the same probability rho n and let mu be the expectation of the outcome. So the unbiased estimator can be written like this and rewritten re into this. And then we decompose this yi into two terms, like a mu plus a yi minus mu. And then, so this summation corresponds to the mu term and this summation corresponds to the yi minus mu term. So if we look closely, we realize that this first term is a problematic term because it has mean zero, but its variance is very large. On the other hand, the second term, it has non-zero mean. Actually, the expectation of this is exactly the, the indirect effect we want, and its variance is controllable. So what this says is the first term contains no information, but a lot of noise, whereas the second term contains all the useful information. So ideally, we would want to remove the effect of the first term. So more generally, if we don't consider the Erdos Rain model, if we consider a stochastic block model, we consider a very simple stochastic block model where people can only make friends within the same community. And uh, here we say people make friends with probability rho n if they're in the same community, otherwise they don't make friends. And let mu k be the community level mean. So the graph line in the stochastic model would correspond to um, this. In this case, again, we can do the similar decomposition as before. The indirect effect equals this and this. 
we can decompose yi into two terms, the community level mean and yi minus the community level mean. And again, the thing related to the community level mean is bad because it contains a lot of noise with no information, but the second term is good. It contains all the useful information. So the idea is whether we can remove the effect of the first term. So we'll look closely about what is, what is this first term and see how we want to remove this. Oops. Okay, so our unbiased estimator recall that it takes this form, which can be written as like a weighted average of the yi's, um, where it's like sum of the gamma, which are some weights function with yi. And then, so if we look closely at the previous problematic term, we realize the problematic terms equals sum of gamma i mu k i. Basically, this is the inner product of the weight function with a piecewise constant vector. So this piecewise constant vector is like constant within community. The question is, what is this piecewise constant vector? We realize that this is exactly the principal components of the graph. Okay, so what this really says is the problematic term is the inner product of the weights with the principal components of the graph. So we would ideally want to remove the variation of the weights along the direction of the principal components of the graph. So what we will do next is very simple. We simply modify the original weights a little bit and make it orthogonal to the principal components of the graph and so that we can remove the variation along those directions. So that's what we do here. This is our original weights. We just add something to it, makes it a new weight and uh, make sure that the weights are orthogonal to the principal components um, of the graph. Now, there is only one problem left, is we don't know the graph, so we don't know the principal components. So instead, what we do is we estimate the principal components by the first few eigenvectors of the adjacency matrix. And we just substitute things here and uh, get our new weights. And we call our estimator a PC balancing estimator because we are balancing for the principal components. And um, so, so now we have this nice estimator and we show uh, some theoretical results for this estimator. We show that now if the graph on is low rank and if, and if um, our graph is sparse, then we can show that the PC balancing estimator minus the estimate over square root rho n would converge to a nice Gaussian distribution. So some observation from here is that, uh -oh. oops, is that this estimator is consistent in, relevant, uh, in rel uh, relatively dense case and the asymptotic, we, we have a nice asymptotic normal distribution. Uh, one final remark is that we realize the convergence rate here is not as good as the direct effect. And this is actually consistent with our intuition that estimating the the indirect effect is a problem that's much harder than estimating the direct effect. So I think that's it. I still have some quick simulation results, but I don't have, think I have the time to cover them. So I think that's it. And thank you everyone for listening and feel free to ask any questions. Thank you.